Okay, in this section, we're going to be doing 10.3, which is the complex plane. Um, and then we're also going to talk about De Maurier's theorem. Okay, so they're going to kind of correlate what we know about polar coordinates to um, complex numbers or imaginary numbers, right? Complex numbers have imaginary parts and real parts. And then eventually, um, this is all just building us up until we can eventually start talking about vectors, okay? So vectors won't happen until 10.4, but for right now, we're just gonna kind of connect everything together. So previously we learned about um, polar coordinates. They are gonna use polar, some things about polar coordinates to describe complex numbers. And then later they're gonna use um, some of that polar coordinates information and some of the complex information to define a vectors, okay? So it's all kind of related, okay? It's all connected in a way. And so we're just kind of building upon that. So this section really does stand out on its own because it's a lot different from the polar sections that we've been covering. And it will be different from the vector stuff that we'll be getting to in a little bit um, in the next like four sections of the class, last four sections of the class. Um, this section is really all by itself. It's the one section that talks about complex numbers. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get right into it. So it says a complex number can be written as, you know, Z is the complex number and it's written as X plus Y I, where X is the real part and Y is the imaginary coefficient, okay? And so what we do is we can graph them, but when we graph them, this is considered my real axes and this is considered my imaginary axes, okay? So the X coordinate represents the X, the real component in that complex number. And then the Y value corresponds to the imaginary component of that um, complex number. So when it says for you to draw the point corresponding to Z equal to three minus two I, what you're plotting is the point three for X and negative two for Y. So you're gonna go over to the right, positive three for X and then down two for Y. And that's where that um, complex number lies, okay? Now remember this axis is different from the normal axes we've been doing. We've been doing just X and Y and both of those number lines were real number lines. So now when we're talking about this, we're not graphing it on the Cartesian coordinate system. This is a completely different coordinate system, just like the polar coordinate system was different from that rectangular coordinate system, okay? Cartesian coordinate system is a rectangular coordinate system for only real numbers. This is a rectangular coordinate system, but it's for complex numbers. So it's different than everything we've been doing up to this point. Now, it says a polar representation of this complex number can be written by finding the angle theta and the radius of the circle drawn to the point Z equals three minus two I. The radius is called the magnitude or modulus of Z and it's denoted by the absolute value of Z or it's not really even an absolute value. It's not an absolute value. It's just um, bars around the Z, okay? Um, you could think of it as an absolute value because you're just gonna take the positive of the square root, but that more has to do with the fact that R is a length and length has to be positive. Another label is that theta is also called the argument, okay? And we know how to calculate R. R is always found by X squared plus Y squared, so nothing different there. X is R cosine theta, Y is still R sine theta, and then tangent or theta is equal tan inverse of Y over X. So none of that has changed. That's all the same information as we had for the uh, polar coordinates, okay? So then um, what it says, the definition, <clears throat> and it's just saying that same thing. Now this can be found 
by multiplying two conjugates together. So when you have imaginary numbers and you multiply their conjugates together, um, you do end up with this information. So if one of them was labeled x plus y i, then it's conjugate, that little bar on top means conjugate then the other one would be x minus y i. And if I were to multiply these out and distribute them and combine the like terms, turn the i squareds into negative ones, combine everything, you end up with this, okay? So it's just pointing it out that if you multiply the z that you were given and it's conjugate together, you'll still get this. Or you can just take the x component and square it, the y component and square it, and then add them together. That's easier for me, okay? Now it says to convert a complex number between rectangular form and polar form, you're basically just going to use this bits of information, the same as we had in polar coordinates, okay? And then um, the number, the Z, the complex number will then be written as X plus Y I, but X is the same as cosine theta and Y is the same as R sine theta. So the only difference is, is that next to that y, you have an i because it's the imaginary coefficient. And so if you notice this one has an r, that one has an r. So if you factor out the r, you just have r times cosine theta plus i sine theta, okay? Now, here's an example where they want us to actually take the complex number and um, instead of writing it in rectangular form, they want us to write it in polar form. And so the first thing you need to do is plot the point in its rectangular form and see what quadrant it's in because that's gonna help you to identify the angle later, okay? Um, the angle does have to be between zero and two pi. It cannot be a negative and it cannot be a number bigger than two pi or 360 degrees, okay? So, and that's important because that will keep coming up a lot. So then if I were to plot this, if I notice, right, I've got this triangle here. Notice that this length is three because the X value was three. And this length here is three square root of three, but in the downward direction because it's negative three square root of three. Now, if I wanna know what R is, which is over here, I'm gonna use my Pythagorean theorem or the formula that's up there, same thing, right? Um, that's going to be the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared, which gives me this, which gives me the square root of 36, which ends up being 6. So I know that the r is 6. Now to find theta, theta is equal to tan inverse of the y coordinate over the x coordinate. So the y coordinate was negative 3 square root of 3, the x coordinate was 3. These 3s canceled, so it's really tan inverse of negative square root of 3. When I type that in my calculator in decimal mode, it gave me negative 60 degrees. But remember, theta has to be between zero and two pi. So what I did was I took the negative 60 degrees and I just added 360 to it. And I got, um, actually I got 300 degrees. No, that doesn't make any sense. Oh. Yeah. It shouldn't be 120. I don't know where on earth I got 120 from. It should be 300 because yes, the angle could be negative 60 degrees, but if I'm going in the positive direction, I have to go all the way around to get over here. So it should have been negative 60 plus 360 means this should be 300 degrees. which means that when I put it in its polar form, it's gonna be R times cosine of that angle and times I sine of that angle. And then if you wanna put it in radians, you can just do 300 over 180 and then multiply that by, five, by pi. So in radians, it's five pi over three and again, five pi over three. So six times cosine of five pi over three plus I sine of five pi over three. So this is in decimal in a degree and this one is in radians. I usually do everything in, in degrees, 
But if you notice in your computer that it doesn't have the degree symbol for you, it, you have to put it in radians, okay? You don't have a choice. If it does have a degree symbol there or allows you to enter a degree symbol, then you're perfectly fine in entering this as your final answer. Now here, this is Euler's formula theorem. So it says any real number, for any real number theta, this cosine theta plus I sine theta can be expressed as E to the I theta, okay? So if you multiply that by R, then you get that the, the complex number, not only does it have a polar form, it also has what's called an exponential form, okay? Because of this definition. So if they're telling me this equals E to the I theta, well, now I have another form for my complex numbers. So we have three forms for our complex numbers. We have X plus YI, we have R cosine theta plus I sine theta, and we have R equal to E to the I theta. So you really have to pay attention to which form they're talking about because there's four of them for complex numbers, okay? There's this form, the traditional rectangular form. There's this form, which is the polar form. And then now there's this one, there's three, three versions. And then this one, which is the exponential form, okay? So you've got three different forms for the same complex number. Rectangular form, polar form, exponential form. Now, this one says, knowing this, this is like part C from part B up there. Knowing this formula, what is the exponential form of the complex number from example one? So it should be E, it should be R times E to the I times theta. Now remember my theta in that problem above was 300 degrees. And, or if it's in radians, it's five pi over three. And again, your computer inside can't inside a my lab, my labs plus does want this in radians. So make sure you're using the radian mode. It doesn't allow you to type in a degree and it doesn't already have a degree symbol in there. So when that happens, you're forced to type it in as radians. And you can always take a degree and multiply it by pi over 180 to figure out what the radians are. Or you could take your degree amount, put it over 180. Once you have that fraction, you just put the pi next to it. And that's exactly what I did over there, right? I took the 300, divided it by 180, found that fraction and then just tagged on the pi. And that's where I got the five pi over three. Okay, so now example two says plot a point in the complex plane and convert it to rectangular form. So it says plot the point corresponding to Z equals to all of this in the complex plane and write an expression for Z in rectangular form. So one, it says find R and theta. So R is going to be the coefficient in the front and then theta has to be the same here and here. So it's 60 degrees. It says use R and theta to plot in, in the complex plane. So um, you can change it. I converted it to rectangular form already, but remember how you plot these things. You go out three units, right? And then you rotate however many degrees you're supposed to rotate. And so in this case, I'm rotating 60 degrees. And so I end up at this spot there. Now, um, right in my circle would be like this, okay? So that would be my circle with radius three. Again, I can't draw, but you get the idea. My circle with radius three, and then I rotate that point around 60 degrees. Now, what I did was I converted it. X equals R cosine theta. I typed that in my calculator, I got three halves, which is about 1.5. And then I did Y equals R sine theta, typed that in my calculator, I got this, which is about 2.6. So I went over about one and a half and about up 2.6. And sure enough, I landed in that same spot in the rectangular coordinates. Now, if they want the answer in its rectangular form, it's just Z equals X plus Y I. So Z equals what I found for X plus what I found for Y, I. Now, um, another example that they go over, which I didn't have room to put it in here. So I went ahead and wrote it on another page. It says, um, 
to take this and convert this exponential form to rectangular form. And so really it's the same thing. You're, you're doing the exact same process. You don't necessarily have to graph it. You don't need to do this part, but you do need to identify the R and the theta and then use those to convert into X and Y. So R is always gonna be the number in the front and theta is always gonna be whatever's up there times the I, okay? So then R is two and theta is pi over 15. If I wanna know what that is in degrees, I take pi over 15 and I multiply that by um, 180 over pi and I get that it's 12 degrees, okay? So then in order for me to find X, I typed in my calculator in degree mode, X equals two cosine of 12 degrees and I got this value, Y equals two times sine of 12 degrees, I got this value. And so my complex number is X plus Y I. And this is the rectangular form. Now, um, it says the exponential form of a complex number is useful for finding products and quotients of complex numbers. So when you have to like multiply things out, um, the more of them that you have to multiply out, you notice that there's two terms, right? In the rectangular coordinate situation, there's two terms. And in the polar situation, there's two terms. And so can you imagine having to multiply this like two or three of them together? You have to distribute, combine your like terms, distribute in another one, combine the like terms. The more and more of them that are getting multiplied or divided, the more complicated that that's gonna, that algebra is going to be. However, the nice thing about exponential form is in exponential form, it's just one term. And monomials are always easy to multiply. You just multiply the coefficients together. And when you have two things with the same base, you just add their exponents together. And notice they both have an I. So if you factor out the I, you get this particular formula. Same thing when you're dividing. If you're dividing, you just divide the coefficients and then you subtract the exponents. And since they both have an I, they just went ahead and factored out the I. So that makes it a lot easier to, um, to multiply and divide when it comes to these complex numbers. So for this first one, um, we're going to take Z times W where Z is this and W is this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is identify the R's and thetas so that I can write them in their exponential forms, okay? So here, that means that Z is going to be eight E to the I times 40 degrees. W is going to be two E to the I times 20 degrees, okay? So then if I wanna multiply them together, I'm going to multiply the two coefficients and then I'm going to add the two um, angles together. So I get 16 E to the 60 degrees I. And if I need to go back into polar form because it wants the answer in polar form, um, well here it wants it in both. So that's my exponential form. The R is 16 and the theta is 60. So I can go and put it back. It's 16, which is the R, cosine of the angle plus I sine of the angle. Same thing here. I need to divide the coefficients and then subtract the exponents. So I get four and then e to the 20 degrees. That's the exponential form. In order for me to get the polar form, the radius goes on the outside and then it's cosine of the angle plus I sine of the angle. Now we get into de Maurier's theorem, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. It says, now you know how to add, subtract, multiply and divide complex numbers. De Morvier's theorem gives us a general rule for raising a complex number to a power. We will explore this by using repeated multiplication and looking for a pattern. So it says, suppose you have a complex number and you're trying to find Z squared. That means just take Z times Z. So you have this number times this number. Well, when you do that, you're going to get R times R, which is R squared, and then E to the I, and then theta plus theta is what? Let me do it expanded and then I'll compress it, okay? So you get this. 
And then you end up with r squared e to the i times two theta. Okay, so then now let's expand that. Um, and what happens if you are doing z cubed? Well, that's like taking z squared times z. So the one we just found times another one. Well, r squared times r is r to the third and two i theta plus i theta is three i theta. Now to do z to the fourth, you can either do it one of two ways, z cubed times z or z squared times z squared. So if I take z cubed times z, that's the regular z times the one I just found, and that's r times r cubed, which is r to the fourth, i theta plus three i theta is four i theta. Or if I do the z squared times z squared, it's gonna be taking this form and another one of those forms, which is what we got when we did the squares. You get r squared times r squared, which is r to the fourth, and then two i theta times plus two i theta gets four i theta. So then in general, you get this rule. Whatever power you're trying to apply, you're gonna get the radius to that power and then e to that coefficient times i theta. Okay, so in order for me to figure out how to raise this to this power, um, you kind of have to go through the back door, okay? So you have to convert this first into its polar coordinates so that you can identify, so you get the rectangular form, rectangular, and you're gonna convert it to polar so that once you have the r and the theta, you can convert it to exponential. And then you can apply the De Morvier's theorem. And then you can take it back to polar. And then you can take it back to rectangular. Okay, so it's a whole process because the De Morvier's theorem only applies to the complex, I mean, to the exponential form. And you cannot get the exponential form without first having put it in its polar form and vice versa. I can't get to rectangular form until I first put it into polar form, okay? So um, we've got a lot of work to do. So for then this problem, we notice that x is one and y is negative three, square root of three i. I did pl plot it. So square root of three is like one point something or another negative one point something. So I went ahead and plotted it and noticed that it's in quadrant four. So when I find my angle, I need to make sure that my angle is in quadrant four, okay? Now, um, which means all of this is wrong because I know it's wrong. So, We'll talk about it a little bit more as we go. Must have been real tired when I was writing these notes. Okay, so R is gonna be the X coordinate squared plus the Y coordinate squared, which gives me this, which gives me four, which gives me that R is equal to two. Great. Theta is the tan inverse of the Y value over the X value. And when I type that in my calculator, let me make sure I'm in degree mode. Yes, so tan inverse of negative square root of three, I get negative 60. And then if I want to figure what the positive angle is with that, I need to add 360, so I get 300 degrees. So then that means theta is 300 degrees. So the polar form is two times cosine of 300 degrees plus I sine of 300 degrees. The exponential form is two E to 300 degrees I. So then, now, if I wanna find z to the 10th, that means it's gonna be that in polar form. So remember, this is polar form and I'll fix the angle in a minute. Um, so the polar form raised to the power 10, or you could even have the exponential form raised to the power 10. And then we applied the De Morvier's theorem which tells us to do two to the power 10 and then 10 times this angle, which would be 3000. And then two to the power 10, when I typed it in my calculator, 
I got 10, uh, 1,024. Now for 3,000, remember the angle needs to be between zero and two pi or zero and 360 degrees. So if I subtract 360 degrees from that 3,000, I get 2460, which is still too big. I get 2280. And then that's still too big. So I get 1920, still too big. 1560, that's still too big. 1200, still too big. 840, still too big. 480, we're getting there, but that's still bigger than 360. And finally, I end up with 120 degrees. There we go. And now we get it. Okay, and that's the exponential form of that complex number raised to the power. Now, what I didn't do is I didn't, it says write this in rectangular form. This is not the final answer because that's not in rectangular form. Okay, so I've got to take that and I've got to put it back in its polar form, which would be R and then cosine of that angle plus sine of that or I times sine of that angle. And then I have to take it and I have to put it into its rectangular form rectangular form. And how do we do that? We know that um, x is equal to r cosine of theta and y is equal to r sine of theta. So let's see, 10 to four cosine of 120 degrees is negative 512 and 1024 sine of 120 degrees is 886. Oh, let's not do that because it's not going to let me. So sine, it's going to want the exact answer. So I get 10 to 4 square root of 3 over 2. I can reduce this by 2, which gives me 512 square root of 3. And that's what they're going to want. So Z equals the X value, negative 512 um, plus 512 square root of three I. Now you may second guess yourself and say, oh, this is not gonna be in that same quadrant. No, it's not. Because this quadrant um, is for the original complex number. But I then took that complex number and raised it to the 10th power and got this. So it's very possible that it's not gonna be in the same location as the original complex number. Okay, now we have, um, it says in the previous courses, when you were asked to solve x squared equal to four, how many answers were there? When you took the square root, you ended up with plus or minus, right? So you had two answers. And that is because there are two values of x that when squared, it gives us four as a result. To find all the roots of a complex number, the following theorem can be used. And so then what it's doing is it's taking a complex number. And if you're taking um, the nth root or the third cube root, the square root, the cube root, the fourth root, all of those roots, right? You have to start with the smallest, which is the square. So that's why it says that n, which is the index of the root, okay? n is the index of the root. It's the number that goes here, okay? Um, it has to be either square or cube or fourth root higher than that, okay? So then um, the root, there's going to be n number of complex roots. So for instance, there's indistinct nth roots. 
So what I mean by that is if you have um, the cube root of a number, there's going to be three roots. If you have the fourth root of a complex number, there's going to be four roots. If you have seven roots of a complex number, there's going to be seven roots, okay? So seven answers. And this is the formula on how to find every single one of those answers. So what you do is you use k equal to zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up into the index that you were given. So let's say for instance, I was given the square root. I would only do zero and one, and that's it. That's my two roots right there. Two numbers to give me my two roots. If I had a cube root, that means I would have three zeros. So I would have to use k equal to zero, one, and two. If I had seven roots, I would have to do zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you go all the way up into your index minus one. Why minus one? Because zero is gonna take up a spot and then you have your counting numbers, okay? So you're gonna be shy one less of that index number. Now, um, there's two ways. So you have your complex form, which means the, the nth root of your radius, and then i, one over n times theta plus two pi k, because of the um, periodic functions, cosine and sine, or the cube root or the nth root of r, and then cosine of theta plus two pi over k over n, plus i sine of theta plus two pi k over n. So again, same thing, depending on what your index is, that's the number of roots that you're gonna have, the different number of roots that you're gonna have, okay? So it says find the complex fourth roots of this number, which means I'm gonna have four answers and I need to do them for k equal to zero, k equal to one, k equal to two, and k equal to three. And that gives me the four roots, okay? But before I do that, I want to put it in this form. Um, and so before I can do that, and it says express in exponential and polar form using radians. So I haven't done that and I'm gonna do that in a little bit, okay? Excuse me. So I have first need to find R and theta if I wanna put it in exponential and polar. So for R, we're doing the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared, we get this. For theta, we're doing the y over the x, we get this. That is not um, in this quadrant over here. Negative 45 is down here, okay? This is a whole pi units over there, okay? So if I take this and I add 180 degrees, that's where I got the 135 from, okay? Now, I know what these are, and let's see what 135 is in radians. So 135 um, divided by 180. So that's actually the same as 3 pi over 4. So this is in the exponential form. So if I want to find zk, right, I don't know which one I'm finding, whether it's 0, 1, 2, or 3. It's going to be the fourth root because that's my index of my r, which happens to be 2 square root of 2. And then i to the 1 over n, my degrees, plus 2 pi k. And so instead of 135 degrees, we're going to use the radians because that's what it said to use. So 3 pi over 4. So for k equal to 0, that means that this is 2 pi times 0, which is 0. So this would just be 3 pi over 4. And so if I simplify that, that's going to be 3 pi over 16. OK. And this I just left alone because it has that square root inside of it. So don't mess with that number. Just leave it like that. If it were a nice number, you might actually try to take the fourth root of it, but you've got a fourth root of a square. If you put this in your calculator, you're going to get a decimal, so don't mess with it. Now for k equal to 1, that means that k equals 1, so 2 pi times 1 is 2 pi. So 3 pi over 4 plus 2 pi is actually going to give me 11 pi over 4. 
So then if I have 1 fourth times 11 pi over 4, then that means I'm going to have 11 pi over 16. Now the same thing for k equal to 2. So now you have 2 pi times 2, which is 4 pi. So I'm going to go over there and I'm going to add 4 pi. And so then my radians that I get, these are not degrees, these are radians, is going to be 19 pi over 4. So when I multiply by 1 fourth, I get 19 pi over 16. And then the last one is if k equal to 3. So that's 2 pi times 3, which is 6 pi. And I get 27 pi over 4. And so if I multiply that by 1 fourth, I get 27 pi over 16. And so these are all the exponential zeros, okay? Exponential forms. But not only did they want the exponential forms using radius, they also wanted the polar form. So remember, the polar form is the radius and then parentheses cosine of that angle plus I sine of that angle. Same thing for the next one, the radius and then cosine of this angle plus I sine of this angle. Next one, radius cosine of this angle plus I sine of this angle. And then the last one, um, the radius and then cosine of 27 pi over 16 plus I sine of 27 pi over 16. And now you have all of the answers in the specific forms. If they wanted you to put it into rectangular form, you would have to actually um, take the tangent of each of these angles to figure out, or actually no, you would have to um, basically just evaluate this and then distribute the R in and that's it. But they don't ask you for that because it's gonna be a little difficult to distribute in this fourth root of two square root of two, right? So just leave it like that. But that is the end, it is kind of a lot. This is the only section that talks about these complex numbers. So they really threw everything at us in this particular section. So it talked about the three different forms, rectangular form, polar form, exponential form, converting between the three. Um, we talked about how to multiply them together using the exponential form and then converting back into the other two forms. And we talked about how to raise it to an exponent and then now we even talk about how to find roots of complex numbers. And so that's pretty much all we're gonna do with this section and all we're gonna do with complex numbers for now, okay? But there will definitely be some problems in the homework, of course, some on the review, some on the test, and even some of this stuff on the final exam. So it's even though it's the only section we have on complex numbers, there's a lot of good information in this section that we will be using.